right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jessica Green. I'm the digital asset and web manager at the Vita Library, and this is my manager, Toby Simpson, our head of digital. So, um, go. The, um, the roots of the testimonies project we're going to talk about today began with the library's relaunch in 2011, the start of a four-year heritage lottery funded project entitled Keeping Truth Alive. This grant supported new educational and outreach opportunities for the library, as well as serving as a massive boost to our digital presence with a new website, new social media presence, and our first digital resource. My colleague Toby was managing this project overall, and one part of it involved starting up a small group of volunteer translators. The group grew over time and would become instrumental to the two projects we are presenting about today. Um, as the library's first digital curator, that was my first um, title at the library, um, I worked on a number of digital projects, including the Pogrom November 1938 website, um, which you can see up here. Um, as well as our first digital resource that showcased a collection of refugee family papers in our, in our library, um, which Toby and I presented on back at the DCDC conference in Leeds in 2015. So I'll just spend a few minutes now telling you about the Pogrom, um, Pogrom November 1938 website, which was something of a pilot project for the work we are doing today around digital resources for Holocaust testimony. Today, Toby and I will be talking about two very rare and par powerful sets of early testimonies. The first of which is a collection of about 350 reports that were gathered um, by the library's founder, um, Alfred Wiener, and his colleagues at the Jewish Central Information Office in Amsterdam in the days, weeks, and months following the November pogrom of 1938, more commonly known as Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. Today, the library speculates that the reports were sourced using the JCIO's several usual, usual methods of information gathering, including face-to-face -face interviews, telephone conversations, letters and written reports, selecting and cropping newspaper articles, and obtaining informal intelligence via conversations and correspondence with um, their um, known organizations and contacts. Um, no voice recordings or original text formats survive, so the first version of the testimonies we have in our possession are a series of typed reports. This unique collection presented a number of opportunities and challenges regarding access and dissemination to a wider audience. The accounts offer a wider picture of rising anti-Semitism in the 1930s, hostility to refugees outside of Germany and occupied Austria, and the first descriptions of early concentration camps like Dachau and Buchenwald. They also highlight a number of things to modern readers, such as the reality that the survivor generation is passing away and the urgent need for effective Holocaust education around the world. The work of Holocaust survivors has played an important educational role across communities in the UK, and visits of survivors to schools have contributed greatly to enriching young people's understanding of issues of tolerance, diversity, and citizenship. In the years to come, however, these visits will become increasingly impossible as those with personal memories get older and pass away. With our rare collections of early eyewitness testimony, the library has the potential to address this community need by reviving the voices of a generation of Holocaust survivors whose life stories are already passing from memory into history. By preserving and sharing the voices of the oppressed, the library continues its mission to be a living memorial to the evils of the past. Although there is no doubt in our, to, in our minds as to the importance of preserving and sharing these collections, the method for doing so presented a number of unique challenges. One challenge was that the vast majority of the accounts are in German, um, with a handful also in Dutch, French, um, and English. If we were to make these collections accessible to as wide an audience as possible, we would first have to translate them into English. Luckily, we had an incredibly dedicated volunteer who is sadly no longer with us by the name of Ruth Levitt, who led a small team of volunteers in translating the entire lot. The guidelines and edit editorial principles that she developed during this process were used as a framework for translating the larger set of testimonies Toby will talk about in a minute. Another major um, challenge was the practical development of a digital resource that would serve as a companion website to the book publication of New English Translations. Again, we were very lucky that Ruth was able to find Pete, Vo Pete Vox of the London-based web developer's images, who graciously worked with us to develop the website pro bono using the open source content management system ModX. The website's original features included the new English translations side-by-side -side to downloadable PDFs of the original documents, 
contextual historical information and photographs, a detailed historical timeline, and links to relevant books and web resources. In addition to a full text search, users can browse the testimonies by name, subject, and place keywords, as well as follow links to relevant testimonies. Since one of the editorial principles was to leave Nazi terminology and anti-Semitic insults in the original German, the development of a detailed glossary and in-text tooltips allows for better understanding of the text by English speakers and those less familiar with World War II history or the German language. Over the years, we have continued to enhance the website and improve the quality of translations. One of the new features we added with the help of a freelance sub-editor was to upload transcriptions of the original German, Dutch, and French texts, allowing for full text searching of these as well as the English translations. Um, so I'm just going to, to, to uh, pick up the story at that point um, uh, where the, the, the website had launched. And it happened to be at a time um, which allowed us to take advantage of an opportunity to expand the project. Um, and one of the great things about that uh, November po Pogrom project is it allowed us to, uh, first of all, grow this small group of volunteer translators, uh, which continues to this day in an expanded form. Uh, but we were also able to demonstrate the demand for and the, and, uh, the impact of the, uh, the project um, to, to others, especially through uh, the Google Analytics, which showed that there had been a, a, a big take up of the project among our researchers with several thousand unique users per year, that it was growing year on year. So um, it really helped us to demonstrate that there were people out there who wanted to hear these voices um, from, from these testimonies that are incredibly vivid and direct. Um, so. Uh, we were lucky enough that it, it, we were ready at the time when the UK government was starting to develop its plans for a UK Holocaust memorial uh, near Parliament. And so we were in a good position to put in a bid for funding uh, for a larger and more ambitious project. So um, I suspect some of you will have already heard about this uh, memorial and learning centre. It's going to be built uh, in Westminster's Victoria Tower Gardens in the coming years, according to uh, a design by the world-renowned uh, architect David Adjaye. And uh, it's, it's one of the major aspects of the memorial is to include resources um, that come directly, f that, that share directly the voices of Holocaust survivors. And the Vena Library is quite unusual in having such important collections of eyewitness testimonies from Holocaust survivors, and in particular, um, early testimonies. And I think that's, that's the important thing about the, the, these collections, is that they showcase the voices of Holocaust survivors of an earlier generation. And they're very, um, the, both collections in different ways have this very direct, vivid uh, power, um, having been composed so close to the events themselves. Um, so, broadly speaking, as Jess said, there are two collections, one of them r relating specifically to the November pogrom, which is a, 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 a relatively smaller collection, but there's also a much larger collection um, uh, of eyewitness testimonies held at the Vena Library, which was gathered by uh, the uh, he then head of research, Ava Reichman, uh, who's, who's pictured here. Um, she managed over the course of six years between 1954 and 1960 to gather some 1,300 survivor testimonies, which in total is approximately 1 million words of testimony and 30,000 pages. So an absolutely immense corpus of, of material. It's quite daunting for us that we wanted to, to expand our translation work to, to embrace that. And really without the, uh, the opportunity that was offered by this new memorial and the funding that, that, that uh, came along with it, it would have been completely impossible to, to attempt to translate such a, a large and varied amount, a set of material. But um, especially having worked with this material over the past uh, five years or so, I really have a sense of how each voice within it, and it's incredibly varied, people uh, from uh, dozens of different countries from so many such a very different experiences uh, each account has its own value it's quite an extraordinary collection and it was one of the collections that uh, helped the library recently be awarded uh, designated collection status by the arts council which really you know was uh, something that really recognized the exceptional historical value of this material so as just said we never really had any doubt about the value of 
this material, but the question was how to take a huge corpus of material, mostly in German, and make it more accessible for people. And of course, translation uh, was a huge part of that. Um, so um, these, uh, the award that we received from the, the Department of Communities and Local Government seems like a lot of money, but actually, as I've already mentioned, the sheer scale of this collection ruled out the, the possibility even of translating the corpus in, in full by outsourcing the material. And we didn't want to just translate the material and then leave it there in the collections. We wanted to translate it and do a lot more. Um, for example, the, the, the collection wasn't properly digitized. It wasn't transcribed in the original language. Uh, very little research had been done into the origins of the collection. Uh, so when we bid for this uh, grant, we uh, committed to all of these additional aims as well. Um, so at the core of the project, of, of course, however, was translation. And this was a complex uh, a task. I've tried to set out the different strands of it, uh, of the work that was involved. And we really didn't want to stop doing volunteer translation either, because first of all, we had built up a really quite skilled group of volunteer translators who were producing uh, excellent work and uh, so we actually wanted to expand that it was also a good way of engaging with uh, the wider community to bring in people there was a lot of it i was actually really surprised by the amount of people who wanted to get involved with volunteer translation but of course managing that volunteer translation was a challenge in itself we also were you know it was a real novelty for us to have any kind of budget to, to spend on translation um so uh we we uh we decided that the, the best way to, to approach that was to do a competitive tender uh, to encourage as many different translation companies as possible to apply. Um, we completed the, the digitization and transcription of the material before that. Um, and in 2017, we chose to work with a company called Lifeline Language Services. They were uh, the most uh, cost effective, but they also had demonstrated experience doing work with eyewitnesses in the International Criminal Court. Uh, they demonstrated a real sensitivity to working with translators dealing with what was often very distressing material. Um, and they've been really good so far. And one of the things that has been good is they've been very flexible in terms of us um, uh, delivering batches of work to them, which, where we, which, which reflects our need sometimes to change priorities about which accounts should be translated first. Um, and we also decided that rather than having uh, the quality assurance done on every single um, item, we would, we would focus on, to an extent on output rather than uh, than detailed quality assurance, uh, and so we decided to, the method, it would be better to do that by a sampling method. Um, so that does bring me to the question of quality assurance. So we, we, uh, we of course, take quality assurance very seriously, and we uh, wanted to ensure that uh, the, the translations reached a certain standard, and that was one of the reasons that we developed uh, uh, clear editorial guidelines uh, an English language style guide, which has actually been very useful for our organization as a whole to adopt a kind of house style to, 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 to how, how we present the English language. Um, and so we uh, have, have developed a, a good workflows for QA uh, of this material, but at the same time, the sheer volume of it means that there is actually an, always going to be an element of error, and there is always going to be an element of, of risk as well. So what we have really decided is that we uh, don't, aren't going to see this as a, as a kind of linear process where we get to a certain point and all the translations are perfect and then we press go. We recognize that in, in the, in the uh, era of online resources where it's possible, unlike in a book, to, to make imp improvements after launch, uh, we, we see it as a continuous process of improvement. And that's actually something that we did also with the November program project where we've continued to uh, uh, encourage people to, re to report any errors that they may find. Um, we've continued to, to uh, ask volunteers and copy editors to get involved with improving the quality. And actually the quality has of, the, of, of the translations is, is very good, but we recognize there's, there's never going to be perfection in this regard, unless we want to sacrifice access. So that does lead to some of the uh, issues of problems and challenges. Um, 
the, it has been a daunting for an organisation like ours, which is relatively small and hasn't taken on a, project, a translation project on this scale, to, to manage the volume of metadata, the, the, the file management, the quality assurance. Um, and so as we're, leading, we're aiming towards launching the, the expanded website uh, towards April next year, and uh, as we're leading on to this, we're sort of getting to a critical mass where we are uploading files, converting files, uh, and there's a lot of file management and workflow management involved with that. And one of the things that has been quite helpful is I've been using a, 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 a translation software uh, called Deja Vu by a company called Actual, which does have a, a, an excellent kind of project management where you can have a, a sort of structured hierarchical files and you can compare the original with the translation and also gives you an export preview and it is compatible with a really large number of file types um, for import and export. So that has been incredibly useful actually for the management of the project. Um, we also have had uh, to overcome issues uh, with relation to cataloging. So this actually uh, was the first collection really, well these two collections, the November Pogrom Testimonies and the, um, and, and the 1950s Testimonies are the first collection where we've really had to manage a large volume of item level metadata and digital objects together. Um, and I'm not going to go into the granular detail of that, but I think the point I want to make is that um, the November, the, the smaller scale project allowed us to catalogue that in full to, to, with ISAG uh, compliant records. Um, uh, and, that, and that has given us a template for the larger project. So in a way, by breaking down this massive uh, project and having a pilot which is based on a smaller thing. We were quite lucky that they, they had their similarities in that respect, but it definitely helped us to, to get to grips with, with uh, this very large collection and how we would manage the records, uh, how we would describe the material and how we would get it uploaded onto our collection management system. Um, we've also had to negotiate issues relating to copyright and data protection. And again, you know, that is also a question of a management of risk, but it's also been an opportunity for us to reach out to our audiences. Um, we've uh, made efforts to try and contact the uh, interviewees and also their descendants. It has been a bit of a challenge, perhaps not surprising considering the average age of uh, the people who gave eyewitness testimonies in the 1950s is uh, over 100. So um, we have, there are, we are in contact with a few still uh, surviving uh, people who, who gave testimonies, but uh, we're also attempting to contact ascendants, and it, we see that as an opportunity for outreach, and also, of course, uh, it's a question of risk management around issues like copyright and data protection. I think I'm just going to finish by saying we've had... Oh, sorry, just this is an example of how the smaller collection of testimonies and how we catalogued them on the item level and shows you just a little glimpse of, of the kinds of metadata and keywords that we've been attaching to the records. And finally, I just want to talk about a few hurdles and challenges that we've had to uh, overcome. Except for that, perhaps uh, uh, one of the things that has been difficult is we've tried to, um, this has been a major expansion of our digital collections and we've, we, the, the solution that we've looked towards for, which Jess is about to talk about, for our uh, websites and digital infrastructure relied on fiber optic and actually our fiber optic connection only just went live uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, after 18 months of having gone through the application and building process. So that just goes to show how some of the critical elements of it can really sort of throw the bigger project uh, off. But uh, we, yes, and of course we had to go through multiple issues with, with our cataloging. But we've got there in the end and we think that the product in, is going to really be worth the wait. So I'm just going to hand over to Jess to talk about what we're going to. Okay, so I'll just go through this very quickly, but Basically, instead of creating one website to showcase both sets of testimonies, we decided to use the same platform to create two very similar websites, each with the same um, framework and basic functionality, but with slightly different looks and feels. Um, these will, this will bring together all the work that we've been doing over the past couple years around transcription, translation, um, cataloging, and research. Um, in the past, both sets of testimonies have been made available in the original German on the subscription-based um, Testaments to the Holocaust database by Cengage Gale. Um, uh, but our, our two new websites, including the first iteration of the Pogrom November 1938 website, um, increase public access by making them available in English, making them available online for free, um, and presenting them as separate collections with their relevant historical um, 
contextual information. Um, but while we feel it's important to have two separate websites um, to really con um, contextualize these testimonies, um, we want people to be able to stumble upon these collections while searching for relevant material or themes in our collections catalog or on Google. Um, so we added another dimension to this project um, because and making it made it, it our first real attempt at creating a truly integrated approach to digital resources. Um, so this is a shift away from the more typical kind of digital island, as we've been calling it, approach taken by most heritage organizations, including ourselves. So we um, will basically be cataloging each of these testimonies first in our collections catalog, based on um, showing what, uh, what Toby just showed a second ago, um, and then use the catalog's API to dynamically display relevant metadata for each of the accounts on a separate website using a digital um, viewer developed by a German company called Intronda. Um, it has a number of plugins as well um, that will allow us to take advantage of really rich features um, for audience engagement, including on-the-fly PDF generation, a AAAF compliant image API, um, embedded search engine based on Apache Solar, um, things like allowing users to create their own collections and add comments to images, a flexible access conditions based on API, um, IP addresses. So just to quickly show you, here's some mock-ups that we've made um, that will show what the new websites will look like. So as you can see, um, they kind of have the same framework, but a slightly different look and feel. Um, on the left, you'll see a results page um, that will have fasted um, browsing um, based on um, Wiener Library um, keywords that were added as part of the cataloging process. Um, um, and on the right, you see um, on the left will be a tab for metadata, and that's being pulled from our, from our collections catalog, so it'll be sitting in there as well. Um, in the middle, you'll have um, the original German text, um, and the English translation, um, an actual scan of the object, um, as well as a document blog um, that we're planning to use the Omeka Neatline plugin so we can build visualizations like timelines and maps, and on the right, some related testimonies. So yeah, we'll have questions later, thank you. <laughs>